Wall construction begins after the subfloor has been fastened in place. The wall system of a wood-framed building consists in exterior walls that have window and door openings and interior walls that have door openings and archways. Interior walls are also called partition walls and they divide the living area of the house into separate rooms. Partitions can either be load-bearing or non-load-bearing. Load-bearing partitions support the ends of the floor or ceiling joists. Non-load-bearing partitions usually run in the same direction as the joists and carry little weight from the ceiling or the floor above. Traditionally, 2x4 lumber is used to build a one-story house, but today, 2x6 lumber is most common for exterior wall framing because the additional width provides more room for insulation. Components of a wood-framed wall include studs, plates, headers, trimmer studs, sills, cripple studs, corner posts, and for some applications, braces might be required. Studs are vertical framing members that run between the wall plates. Studs are usually spaced 16 inches on center, but sometimes for advanced framing methods and in certain situations, 24 inches on center can be used. The plate at the bottom of the wall is called a bottom plate, and the one on top is called top plate. The top plate is usually doubled for additional stability. Corner posts, also called corner assemblies, are constructed wherever a wall ties into another wall. Outside corners are at the ends of a wall. Inside corners occur where a partition ties into a wall at some point between the ends of the wall. Typical designs of corner posts are shown in this image. On the top left, we have an outside corner construction using only tree studs. This setup is also called California Corner. Top right, there is an outside corner construction using two studs with short blocks between them at center and ends. A third full-length stud can also be used instead of blocks. Bottom left, we can see inside corner using metal clips. Insulation can fill entire wall cavity. And finally, bottom right, inside corner construction using a block laid flat. A full-length stud can be used instead of a block. All corner posts should be constructed from straight studs and should be well nailed. A rough opening must be framed in a wall wherever a door or window will be placed. Rough opening dimensions must allow the window or door to fit, plus the required clearance around the frame. Rough door openings are framed with a header, trimmer studs, wall studs, and in some cases, cripple studs. A header is placed on top of a rough opening, and it is supported by trimmer studs that fit between the bottom plate and the bottom of the header. The rough opening for a typical window includes the same members as for the door plus rough sill and bottom cripple studs. A rough window sill is installed at the bottom of a rough window opening. Cripple studs are nailed between the sill and bottom plate and spaced 16 inches on center like the rest of the wall. Additional cripple studs might be placed under each end of the sill for additional support. Some oval, round, or irregularly shaped windows have bracing and other framing members in place when they are delivered. Header size is determined by the width of the opening and the load bearing down from the floor above. The tops of door and window openings in all walls are usually aligned with each other. Therefore, all headers are the same distance from the floor. The standard height of walls in most residential wood-framed buildings is 8 foot 3 quarter inches or 8 foot 1 inch from the subfloor to the ceiling joists. Standard door height is 6 foot 8 inches. For standard height door openings in standard height walls, cripple studs are not necessary if a 12 inch wide header is placed directly below the top plate. If a header less than 12 inches is used, then cripple studs are necessary, and they are generally spaced on regular stud layout. All wall components should be cut before the wall is assembled. 
Studying the blueprints can determine the number and lengths of studs, trimmer studs, cripple studs, headers, and rough sills required for the building. If necessary, the components are cut to length with a circular saw or radial arm saw on the job site. If the project involves large housing tracks, framing members are often cut to size at the lumber yard and delivered to the job site. Wall components are nailed together and the complete wall is raised into place. This is an example of a wall that lays on the subfloor and is about to be nailed together. Carpenters must lay out where each wall is to be placed before construction begins. There are two types of procedures involved in wall layout. First one is horizontal plate layout. The first step in wall layout is to snap chalk lines on the floor to indicate the exact location of walls. The location of the walls must be according to the floor plan. After the lines are snapped, the top and bottom plates are cut to length and placed next to each other by the chalk line, and they are temporarily nailed together. Dashed lines show where each wall will be placed using measurements from the floor plan. On job sites, these lines would be snapped using chalk line. The X marks on one side of the interior wall lines show the sides of a line where the wall is to be placed. Lines snapped for exterior walls are laid out by measuring in the thickness of those walls. For a 2x6, the actual dimension is 1.5 inches by 5.5 inches, so the measurement should be about 5.5. After the bottom and top plate are tucked next to the chalk line, on the edge they can be marked to indicate the location of corner posts, regular studs, trimmer studs, and cripple studs. A procedure for laying out the first exterior wall is shown in this video. At each end we are going to mark the corner post components, which are two studs with blocks or a full stud in between them and then plates are marked for the first stud from the corner post by measuring 15 and a quarter inches from end. Subsequent studs follow 16 inches on center layout. This layout method ensures that the edges of standard wall sheathing or gypsum board panels fall on the centers of the studs. The letter mark will indicate on which side of the line the member will be placed. Dimensions for the widths of rough door and window openings are calculated based on door or window width, finish frame thickness, and half an inch shim clearance at the sides of the frame. A procedure for laying out studs for the second wall is shown in this image. The plates are marked for the first stud to be placed 15 and a quarter inches from the outside edge of the first wall. This layout allows the corner of the first panel on the second wall to align with the edge of the first panel on the first wall. In addition, the opposite edge of the panel on the second wall will break on the center of a stud. This image shows a procedure for laying out studs for partitions. If wall panels are placed on the exterior wall first, followed by the partitions, Wall plates for the partition are marked for the first stud to be placed 15 and a quarter inches from the edge of the panel on the exterior wall. If panels are to be placed on the partitions before they are placed on the exterior wall, then the wall plates of the interior wall are marked for the first stud to be placed 15 and a quarter inches from the unpaneled exterior wall. The 15 and a quarter inch measurement ensures that standard size gypsum board or interior finish panels will fall over the center of a stud. Vertical layout is a procedure for calculating the lengths of vertical framing members, making it possible to pre-cut the studs, trimmer studs, and cripple studs required for a building. The most efficient vertical layout procedure involves a wall framing story pole, which is a 1x2 or a 1x4 marked to indicate the length of studs, trimmer studs, and cripple studs. A story pole reduces the possibility of making mathematical errors and allows measurements to be retained for future use. Information required to mark a story pole is taken from wall section views, door and window schedules, and door and window details shown on the prints. 1. Measure and mark rough wall height on story pole. 
2. Mark position of bottom and double top plates. 3. Mark position of header. Measure down for rough window. For improved productivity, corner posts for building can be constructed at one time using a bench as shown in this image. A bench is useful for making up large quantities of corner posts. Blocks should be held slightly back from the ends of the studs. If there is no need to save materials, blocks can be replaced with a whole stud. Also, a good alternative is California Corner that requires only two studs. Before nailing, ensure the ends of the studs align with each other. Outside and inside corner posts are commonly assembled prior to wood-framed walls being assembled. Also, many carpenters prefer to frame door and window openings before assembling the rest of the wall. Select two pre-cut wall studs and lay them on the subfloor. Nail trimmer studs to wall stud using 16D nails staggered 16 inches on center. Place header between wall studs and top of trimmer studs. In this example, cripple studs are required over the header. Toe nail cripple studs into header using four 8D nails, two on each side. The procedure for framing window openings is the same as framing door openings. A rough sill and bottom cripple studs are then added. Cripple studs follow the stud layout, which is usually 16 inches on center. After corner posts and door and window openings have been constructed, the entire wall is nailed together on the subfloor. Position top and bottom plates on the subfloor at a distance slightly greater than the length of the studs. Position corner posts and rough openings between the plates according to the plate layout. Place studs in position with crowned side up. Nail the plates into the studs, cripple studs, and trimmer studs. On long walls, breaks in the plates should occur over a stud, over a cripple stud, or over the header if a 4 by 12 header is used without cripple studs. Place top and bottom plates on edge at a distance slightly more than the length of a wall stud. Bottom plate should be placed next to snapped chalk line that marks position of a wall. Place studs, corners, and pre-assembled door and window units in proper positions as marked on top and bottom plates. Move top and bottom plates against the studs. Drive two 16D nails through plates into ends of studs, corners, trimmer studs, and cripple studs. A top plate may be doubled while the wall is lying flat on the floor or after the walls have been raised. The topmost plates are nailed so they overlap the plates below them at all corners to tie the walls together. All top plate ends are fastened with two 16D nails, and in between the ends, 16D nails are spaced every 16 inches on center over the studs so it is easy to identify locations when attaching the sheathing. Butt joints between the topmost plates should be at least four feet from any butt joint between the plates below them. A framed wall is often squared while it is lying on the subfloor. Walls are squared using two tape measures diagonally across the opposite corners. When the two diagonal measurements are equal, wall is square and then it can be braced using braces or nailing structural panels or other exterior wall sheathing to keep the wall square while being raised. Diagonal braces, such as metal braces or wood leaden braces, may be used as diagonal bracing. Fire blocking may be placed in higher walls to slow the rate of a fire that may occur inside the walls. In addition, fire blocking can also be used as a nailing base for the edges of plywood or gypsum board panels. Most walls can be raised manually if enough carpenters are available on the job. As a general rule for lifting wall operation, a carpenter is required for each 10 feet of a wall. The order in which the walls are lifted may vary. Generally, longer exterior walls are raised first.
Then the short walls are raised and the corner posts are nailed together. Extreme care should be exercised when raising walls, especially in windy conditions. Wall panels can be easily cut and damaged by the wind. After the wall has been raised, its bottom plates must be securely fastened to the floor using 16D nails driven through the bottom plate and subfloor and into the floor joists. Wall jacks may also be used to raise walls. Wall jacks are lightweight devices commonly used to raise walls when small carpentry crews are working on a job site. After being raised, the corners of the walls must be plumbed using a plate level and then the wall tops must be straightened. Seismic and hurricane ties are required in areas that experience earthquakes and high winds. Wood to wood ties, such as floor ties and plate ties, are attached to the framing members with galvanized nails. Exterior wall sheathing are the panels fastened to the outside of the exterior wall around the perimeter of the building. Orientated strand board, OSB, is commonly used as wall sheathing for residential and light frame structures, but plywood may also be used. Structural panel sheathing adds enough lateral shear strength wood framed walls to eliminate the need for diagonal braces. Siding, shingles, stucco, or brick veneer is placed over the sheathing to finish the wall. Wall sheathing panels range in thickness from 3 eighths of an inch to 3 quarters of an inch. Wall sheathing panels are typically placed with the long edges in a vertical position, although the long edges may be placed horizontally. If panels are placed horizontally, nailing blocks should be installed between the studs. A 1 8 inch space should be allowed between the panels to prevent buckling, which may result from panel expansion. Typically, 6 D nails are used for wall sheathing panels a half an inch thick or less. 8 D nails are used for panels more than a half an inch thick. 2 inch screws can also be used for panels half an inch thick or less, and 2 and a half inch screws for panels more than half an inch thick. Nail or screw spacing is commonly 6 inches on center along the edges and 12 inches on center at intermediate studs. When placing wall sheathing panels, ensure the first panel is plumb along its vertical edge and level along the horizontal edge. Panel sheathing may be applied when a wall has been squared and is lying on the subfloor. However, problems can occur after the wall is raised if the floor is not level. Builders often prefer to place all panels after the building has been framed. Weather barriers are attached to the wall sheathing to help prevent air and water infiltration into the building. Building paper and house wrap are two commonly used weather barriers. A traditional weather barrier is 15 pound building paper, which is available in three foot wide rolls. Building paper must be sufficiently weatherproof to resist water penetration from the outside, yet not so resistant that it prevents the escape of water vapors from the inside of the building during cold weather. If water vapor is prevented from escaping, condensation could occur inside the walls. House wrap is installed before the window and door frames are installed. Moisture trapped between the exterior finished material and sheathing will cause fungal growth, physical deterioration of the sheathing, and possible loss of structural capabilities of the sheathing. One method for preventing moisture vapor from accumulating between the exterior finished material and weather barrier is using a rain screen wall. A rain screen wall is a moisture management system that incorporates vented or porous exterior finish an air cavity, a drainage plane, and an airtight interior support wall. Moisture vapor or moisture entering the wall cavity is properly drained away and air is allowed to circulate within the cavity to maintain dryness within the wall cavity.